Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, it's right at 1.30, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. We've got a good number of folks on the line, about, about 20 people, and I'm sure, as always, a few more people will join in um, over the next couple of minutes. So today on the agenda, um, we have an update from FWC on lionfish and lionfish programs. Um, this is something that we all know is very active. Um, there's always news and updates, um, so it's great to get some more details um, on what's going on with this um, critical issue in our coastal waters today. So as you know, these calls are hosted by the Florida Invasive Species Partnership, um, and they're an opportunity every month to provide information and um, address issues common amongst the Florida Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas um, working across the state. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our feature presenter, Mike Kennison with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Service. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and as we discussed earlier, you should be able to, let me just, yep. Yeah. Okay, you're unmuted. Um, just click on the screen and, and go. And thanks again for joining us. Awesome, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to provide a little bit more background on lionfish. So, um, good afternoon, my name is Mike Kennison. So I work with the lionfish control team up here in Tallahassee with Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, so I'll go over some of the basics of lionfish biology and then a little bit more about our programs and stuff, um, stuff that we've been involved in in the last couple of years uh, for lionfish control. There we go. <laughs> um, so we have a number of non-native uh, fish species in Florida, about 37 that have been documented by the USGS. Some of these species are tropical Pacific species that similar to the lionfish were introduced through the aquarium trade more than likely, but a couple of these like the fairy basslet on the far right are likely due to changing ocean temperatures. So they're kind of moving a little bit outside of their normal range, um, being spotted in places a little further north. Uh, that's a Caribbean species, so we're starting to see some of those here. Um, but most of these species are not becoming established. Uh, they're not causing either economic or ecological damage to the new range that they're in. Uh, should classify them as invasive. And so our main um, example of that is lionfish. So we typically call that one of the worst marine invasions to date that we're aware of. Uh, it's been extremely successful in establishing a population in its non-native range. Um, it has a number of different uh, significant effects on the ecosystem as well as people in that region. Uh, so we use the word lionfish uh, kind of colloquially to talk about several species of fish. Uh, in the world, there's something close to about 22 species of lionfish. They're also called zebrafish or turkey fish. Um, when we're talking about it in Florida and in uh, the Atlantic region, there's really two species that we're referring to. So this is a part of um, genus Terroir, and it's volatans and milles are the two species that we're referring to. Volatans is called a red lionfish, milles is a fire devilfish. About 97% of the fish in this invaded range are the red lionfish. Um, both of these species are visually identical, they behave the same, um, except for a couple of cases where it seems like the milles uh, species may be slightly smaller. They're, they're really hard to tell apart. The only real way to tell the difference is a genetic test, um, but we just refer to them as lionfish. So just so that you're aware, it's two different species, but we're probably talking about red lionfish. So this is a tropical predatory fish. Uh, its native range is the Indo-Pacific, so Philippines, Japan coastline, down around to um, the Indian Ocean, up to the Red Sea is its native habitat. Our first documented uh, report of a sighting was in the 80s, 85 off of Denia Beach. Um, recent genetic studies show that this was probably a very small group of fish that was released, and there's a lot of stories about how they um, were brought here. Sometimes people say a hurricane destroyed an aquarium and released hundreds of fish in the water, or that ballast water brought them here. Um, and part of our outreach is to kind of dissuade those myths. It was more than likely a number of 
intentional and accidental releases. But genetically, um, research-wise, we've been able to tell that this is a pretty homogenous uh, group of individuals. So probably about 100 to 120 individuals um, can be traced back genetically to the, the first group that was released. So they've now become established in the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about um, some of their invasive characteristics, what makes them so successful here. Uh, but basics are that they have a very high reproductive output, um, a really uh, strong appetite. They lack any natural or consistent control mechanism in this range, and they tend to be larger and um, develop a higher density in this range than they would in their native habitat. So these maps um, at the start of reports for the uh, lionfish invasion, the USGS, Reef, which is a nonprofit located in the Florida Keys, and NOAA uh, were taking reports from the public or different agencies uh, just documenting where lionfish were spotted. So the first sighting was off Denia Beach, um, pretty close to Fort Lauderdale in 1985. And then they have uh, been creating these maps for every five years following that first reported sighting. And you can follow the um, sightings begin to spread up and down the east coast of the U.S., throughout the Bahamas, into the Caribbean, and then as of 2018, we really aren't taking um, more reports anymore. They have essentially filled in a lot of the habitat gaps within this range. Um, and you can tell the area is pretty much saturated with reports. Um, so the USGS still maintains some of this data. But they filled in the east coast of the U.S. and then moved their way around the Caribbean um, and really started to uh, ring alarm bells in the late 2000s, about 2009 or so, really became an issue as people in the panhandle were, and along the Gulf Coast, were really seeing these very thick densities of lionfish um, in places that they were diving or fishing uh, and just started to note a lot of changes in some of those habitats due to this. So. They've moved around and they are actually um, off the side of this map. They have moved down to South America and are filling in suitable habitat for them off the coast of Brazil. Um, so as late as 2015 or 16 was the first um, sighting in Brazil and they've continued to spread a little further south there. Uh, on the east coast of the US, their year round range is about where the border of Virginia and North Carolina is off the coast. But as part of their um, characteristics I'll talk about, they are really limited by temperature. And so right about at that state line, um, the temperature of the water is typically too cold for them to survive there year round. So we do get reports, um, especially in the summertime, as far north as Massachusetts or Rhode Island. Uh, those are individuals that just kept going as the water temperature was rising through the summer. And as the winter progresses, they tend to not survive that. So that's really one of the major things, the parameters that really um, stop where they're able to invade. So some of their notable invasive characteristics are, this is a very tough, hardy fish. Um, they have a wide range of different habitat uses, so almost anything uh, from estuaries to river mouths to mangrove habitat, um, artificial reefs as well as natural, so we find them on shipwrecks. Um, any hard bottom as well. And they're able to withstand pressures up to a thousand feet uh, of depth all the way up to the surface. So they can be seen in surface water and all the way down, uh, pretty adaptable to those pressure as well as temperature changes. This is a, um, a sub a tropical species and so it's adapted to pretty warm water. So it's unusual it can survive uh, all the way down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty tough. Um, it also is able to withstand some very large salinity changes. So they have been seen um, in water with as low as four parts per thousand salinity and all the way up to typical ocean water at 35. Uh, otherwise, they are um, able to become sexually mature within a year, spawning pretty frequently during the warm months. Uh, so an unusual strategy when it pertains to lionfish, uh, they uh, create a lot of eggs every four days, there's um, two different gelatinous masses that are about 15,000 eggs each that are released during spawning. Uh, and they float, they kind of stay as a mass, so they uh, aren't your typical broadcast spawner, they just have these gelatinous masses. Um, 
that eventually disperse, but they're able to ride the water columns for up to 30 days, which is one of the main ways that we think they were able to spread using ocean currents through such a vast range at such speed. Uh, so they create a decent number of these eggs. It's not super unusual for reef fish species to create this number, but um, most species will have a very limited window for spawning and lionfish seem to have a very large window for spawning. So they will continue to spawn um, over the course of most of the summer. Because of that, if there is a uh, window of time where the conditions are good, their um, offspring have a better chance of surviving. And so that's one of the other ways that their strategy seems to be uh, very well adapted to spreading quickly and taking over a new range. Um, they have a pretty significant impact both on economically important and ecologically important species. So they are what we call generalist um, opportunistic generalists, and they'll go after any almost anything that they can. Uh, they're able to eat something up to about half their own body size. So they uh, prey on everything from invertebrates up to reef fish, uh, especially the juveniles of those populations. Most people have heard of their 18 venomous spines and the um, neuromuscular toxin housed within them. That diagram in the bottom right on the red dots shows the 13 dorsal spines, the two, um, one on the front of each of the pelvic fins, and then three towards the front of the anal fin. These other fins with the blue dots, so the pectoral um, and the caudal fins, all of those are just fin rays, and so it's something that the lionfish uses to herd prey and also scare off any potential threats. Uh, but it's one of the most notable characteristics about them is that really large kind of spiny appearance. Uh, and then they also have a unique coloration. Uh, in this next picture, I have a, a better picture of lionfish uh, skin, but they have this black and orange and dark brown white striations, and they can be kind of a variety of brightness or darkness, um, but it helps them both to provide a little bit of a warning coloration so other fish are um, more likely to exhibit avoidance as they see lionfish they're sort of a threatening appearance but it also helps them to blend in a little bit with the mottled coloration you might see on reefs um, especially if there's a little bit of sunlight uh, as kind of patterns um, match the sun on reefs and some of our other hard bottoms Uh, and just a little bit more about those spines. So uh, these are not hollow spines. Um, so unlike a snake fang, uh, this is a solid uh, keratin-based spine and it's grooved on either side. Within that groove is this glandular tissue that houses the um, neurotoxin. So one of the things that we try to push in our outreach especially is that uh, this is not like a snake fang where there's a gland at the base of the spine that injects the venom. Uh, this is already housed in the spine, and so if the spine is removed, there is nothing in the meat of the fish or in the rest of the fish uh, that poses a threat. It's not uh, poisonous, but venomous. So we really push that distinction, uh, trying to get the public to understand the difference, um, especially as we're trying to encourage people to remove and eat lionfish. Uh, they do house that um, neuromuscular toxin and reactions vary depending on person. So this, and of course also on wound location, a sting to the hand or the foot is much less serious than say the chest or the head. Um, so this uh, toxin, there's never been a reported death from them, uh, but reactions can vary. Some people have very mild numbness and swelling, causes a significant amount of pain, um, all the way up to dizziness and temporary paralysis. So the best treatment if stung by a lionfish is uh, hot water, um, pretty much as hot as you can tolerate, and that helps to break down the protein within the, um, the toxin. Uh, so we also provide heat packs to people. Um, anything that kind of applies a little bit of heat to the wound area will help to minimize the pain and also uh, keep it from being prolonged, um, prolonged sting. Uh, you can see a little bit better in this picture of um, actual lionfish where those spines are. Uh, the pectoral fins are really large uh, when it's underwater. The underwater pictures, you'll able to see that a little bit better, but these spines are um, visually hard to see the difference between. But you can see that the coloration of the fish is really vibrant, um, and they can be anywhere from pretty dark brown overall to really bright orange.
And to go into a little bit more of why they're such, um, they have a the risk to be such a significant impact on our native species, um, a lot of our economically important species, things like our graze bees, our groupers, and our snappers, um, even juvenile flounders, um, a lot of the juvenile uh, populations of these species are the right size for lionfish to target. And they tend to move from species to species. So the younger lionfish tend to go after some of our smaller damselfish, um, really young gobies and invertebrates like shrimp or crabs or lobster. As they get older and larger, they will go after some more of our reef species um, and can really have a profound impact on recruitment um, for these species. But aside from the economically important species, they pose a threat to a lot of our ecologically important species, so our cleaners and our grazers, um, things like those uh, smaller hogfish or damselfish, and our wrasses and our cleaner shrimp. Uh, they will target those especially when they're younger. And if we lose a lot of the cleaners off of a reef, we may see an increase in parasites or fish diseases um, and bacteria. Uh, grazers are there to keep the algae off of the reef and a lot of um, reefs where we see a high density of lionfish can have a phase shift back to algae and it can really choke the life out of some of these reef species as algae takes over if there's none of these grazers uh, to keep that in check. Uh, and this is very interesting. I mentioned a little bit about how they fan their pectoral fins out and try and herd prey items. Um, they really use that visual, their appearance, to their advantage when they're hunting. Um, this is a demersal species, so they tend to sit still under ledges and kind of ambush prey as prey becomes um, available or is close by. Uh, but they do also move small distances to kind of push prey into corners where they can ambush them. Uh, and one of the interesting techniques that they use is in this picture, uh, there is a larger tank with a lionfish in it, and then in the corner of each of these photos is a small petri dish that has a, a little goby um, prey atom inside of it, and they put food coloring in front of the lionfish. And so the progression of pictures from A to D shows this jet of water, um, and this is pretty unique. It's not the only fish species to shoot water um, to attract prey or to get at prey, but it is unusual. Uh, and they will shoot that jet of water to try and get the attention of prey items and uh, theorize that that is because they uh, prefer to swallow prey head first. Um, and this helps them to get the fish or whatever prey item to face them, making it easier for them to attack and swallow their prey whole. So a little bit more about the research on the effects that lionfish have on our native ecosystem. So this picture in the top left shows a number of prey items taken out of a lionfish, including things like a variety of crab species, tilefish, squid, um, some of our sand perches. They uh, go for a wide variety of different species, and so it can really change an ecosystem, uh, especially if you see a large influx of lionfish and you see a change in the invertebrate population, and that will cascade onward as the lionfish go after bigger and bigger prey. Uh, in some cases, uh, one of these studies saw a um, un undocumented uh, goby found at a deeper depth uh, in one of the stomachs of these lionfish. So they're not picky eaters. Uh, they also, as I mentioned, have a pretty profound um, potential to impact recruitment and biomass. So especially in the Bahamas, and they were looking at um, Reefs that had otherwise not had lionfish impacts up to that point, they saw in as little as six weeks these large impacts on the juvenile fish recruitment. So up to almost 80% reduction in some cases, um, and really a dramatic drop in the uh, percentage of um, prey biomass. So a lot of those smaller species, the biomass of the ecosystem as a whole really changed, kind of shifted upwards. And then on the bottom left here, just to kind of give you a, a picture for what, um, what a really high density of lionfish might look like, uh, it's easier to kind of pinpoint what individual fish are by those white fins. That's the pectoral fins have that white coloration on the edges, and you can just see that that area is just overrun uh, with really only lionfish. There's not a variety of other species there. It just really changes uh, the makeup of that ecosystem. 
So aside from those direct predator interactions, they can also have some non-consumptive effects. Uh, so even larger fish species like our um, snappers and our groupers may change their behavior and avoid certain locations due to an influx of lionfish. Um, they also compete a lot for habitat space. As you can see in that top left picture, they really like cover and they go after these little crevices or holes. Um, they really uh, look for habitat very similar to what lobster look like. So they can have an effect on a lobster population um, and they kind of chase off some of these meso predators at times. Uh, and they'll change the whole dynamic of the reef by causing those predators to relocate somewhere else. And as I had mentioned before, they may cause um, a shift towards an algae dominated reef uh, as you lose a lot of those grazers uh, and some of our larger populations of cleaners, our parrotfish, uh, you may see a lot more algae on a reef and that algae is going to grow really rapidly um, and can really inhibit growth of coral. So one of the main reasons that we have um, a lot of programs and a lot of uh, uh, different agencies interested in working on lionfish is because of the absence of a natural control mechanism. So interestingly, um, especially in the last couple of years, research seems to indicate their skin has even an antibacterial component to it that protects them from a lot of pathogens that other fish might be susceptible to. And they really don't seem to be susceptible to a variety of parasites or diseases we might think of in the Atlantic. Um, and they have no consistent control mechanism, no real predator in this range, uh, especially because it's such a newly introduced species. Uh, relatively speaking, there's not a lot of larger species that view that as prey. Um, so the real uh, predator in this range are humans. Uh, some of the studies looking at uh, how much you have to remove off of a reef in order to have an impact. If you can get roughly half of the population of lionfish off of a reef, uh, you can kind of change the dynamic of the ecosystem and what that does is hopefully allows some niches to open up so that their native predators can come back in and fill in that gap. Um, some of our recent research uh, reports are showing that um, predators, especially like larger groupers or snappers, are able to uh, compete in equal numbers with lionfish. So if there are an equal number of them or close to that uh, equivalent number, they'll be able to hold their own on a reef instead of feeling, uh, instead of uh, exhibiting avoidance behavior. And just to orient uh, a little bit to what we're talking about with our incentive programs, we're primarily working with divers. This is a fish species that doesn't typically take a hook, um, so they're not easily fished for with hook and line or other devices. Um, so the basic gist of most of our programs is to divers using pole spears. And some of these uh, tools you'll see in a couple of pictures are uh, these shorter pole spears. They can be three or six pronged. Um, and then this zookeeper unit, the divers showing at the surface here is just a hard container. Um, typically we recommend PVC, something like that, that's needle proof and protects the diver from accidentally getting stung after harvesting a fish. Uh, and typically we recommend wearing puncture proof gloves in case um, accidental slipping or trying to get something off of a spear, uh, not accidentally getting stung by a fish. Um, and I can make some of these links for, we have a, a YouTube saltwater fishing channel for FWC that has these videos on it, kind of showcasing how divers, uh, some techniques that they need to have in order to safely harvest line fish, especially maintaining neutral buoyancy. Uh, and some of our outreach programs, we really are pushing to get the public to be aware of not damaging the natural habitat or the surrounding environment or other species while they're harvesting line fish. And a lot of times we get questions about filleting lionfish or holding them. Um, this is a refresher where the 18 spines are, especially on the top and the bottom of the fish. So we recommend people hold them by the head or the pectoral fin. And removing fillets is pretty similar to other fish species, so long as you know where to not put your hands, just not on the top or the bottom. And we uh, do demonstrations at a lot of our um, outreach events, or we also provide videos like this one on our saltwater channel and, and get people more uh, comfortable removing fillets from lionfish. 
So in addressing this problem, uh, our initiatives for Florida Fish and Wildlife have been really to minimize the human health as well as the environmental impacts, um, really going after trying to educate people, get them more involved, and then those that are divers or want to be interested in diving to get them into the water and removing barriers to them doing that. So we encourage removal efforts, um, really have removed any regulatory barriers that we could while protecting other species and other habitats, but making it easy for the public to get involved in removing lionfish. Uh, we support a number of tournaments uh, and continually promote some other incentive and educational programs for divers. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of our innovative strategies, our research projects looking at um, different removal methods uh, to hopefully lower the effort involved in removing lionfish since diving and spearfishing is pretty intensive. Uh, and in conjunction with that, we do a lot of outreach and public awareness events. So we have um, an outreach booth <clears throat> and we will go to different festivals and events around the state uh, as staff is available, as well as at our sponsored tournaments, we will try to go to those and provide outreach um, booths there as well. We also have a growing program for presentations and dissections in schools. Uh, whenever we have fish and staff available to try and get hands-on experience for students um, and get them comfortable and introduced to line fish as well as uh, just basics of dissections. <coughs> and our biggest uh, public awareness event is Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day. And that is the third weekend of May each year. So our um, programs have tracked the removal of a little over half a million fish in the last four years. <clears throat> to go over some of the backgrounds of uh, the regulatory changes that have occurred, um, really doing um, making it as easy as possible for people to get involved by removing uh, recreational fishing license requirements. Uh, when harvesting lionfish, so we require the use of a shorter pole spear that's really targeted and marketed for specifically lionfish, um, as well as containers that focus on lionfish collection. <coughs> and the removal of any bag limits or size limits for lionfish. And uh, a lot of um, our deeper water harvesters have been using equipment like rebreathers, which have typically been prohibited from spearfishing, removing that barrier and prohibiting the importation of live or eggs or larvae of lionfish to inhibit any um, further releases or accidental releases in the future. Uh, and then in the last couple of years, really pushing this incentive program, if uh, someone competing in our challenge is able to get 25 lionfish before mini season starts in July, uh, they are eligible to receive a coin. They'll give them one lobster extra each day of mini season. <clears throat> so some of the specifics of our other um, state control programs, like our tournaments and festivals, uh, we help to financially sponsor some of, a lot of tournaments around the state to really provide some outreach materials and uh, kind of coordination for some of these tournaments. So in the last four years, we have helped with 138 tournaments, which has removed over 103,000 lionfish. And this is also a great opportunity for us to raise public awareness, get more information out there, um, encourage people to remove lionfish and to also try them. Um, one of the other things I'll talk about is we're really kind of pushing <clears throat> the involvement of some commercial uh, interest in removing lionfish and trying to get the public uh, to see lionfish as a environmentally friendly food option. Um, so and some of these derbies have really had some profound impacts on local areas, um, notably in the Keys. Uh, if they are able to reduce about half of the number of fish on a specific location, that can have a, a really great effect on um, opening up that ecosystem for native predators to come in. And depending on the location, some studies have, sh have seen that that uh, removal has lasted for multiple months after the initial derby. So we've uh, had a good number of annual uh, repeating derbies that go on. And you can see the numbers have uh, stayed consistent around 20 to 30,000 lionfish removed each year through this program. 
ongoing through the summer, um, and this just started uh, last month for us, is the challenge, which has been the last three years, uh, kind of an individual tournament or incentive program. So we provide a lot of prizes, um, the opportunity for people to kind of track their progress as they're removing fish over the summer with people around the state. Uh, and at the end of the summer, we crown a winner with the, the most number of removals of lionfish uh, Labor Day weekend. So this goes on from lionfish removal and awareness day in May until Labor Day uh, and has really been successful and has really grown in the last couple of years um, since its start. Uh, last year, we had over 600 participants. And this year, so, so far in the first couple of weeks, we've had um, a little over 200 participants in just two weeks of participation. <coughs> so last year ended with 383 divers removing 71,000 fish. And this is one of our newer programs, the Harvest Charter Reimbursement Program, um, which really focuses on some of these charter businesses and is a great <clears throat> way for us to uh, get more of these divers, um, dive businesses involved in both teaching new divers and getting people to really target lionfish specifically. So this has only been ongoing for about a year uh, and 213 vendors last year contributed to more than 11,000 lionfish being removed, but it also got over 700 divers into the water. Um, and this program was really um, focusing on trying to get experienced divers and dive charters who are taking people out uh, especially during the tourism season, to get them involved in line fish removal and to hopefully increase the number of involved divers around the state. <clears throat> so this is just a little bit more about the, the challenge. Um, how we separated between recreational and commercial divers um, has really in, involved a good number of both categories of divers throughout the last three years. And then to go into a little bit of our market development, one of the other goals that we've had um, in addressing lionfish is to try and, and use the uh, commercial market, the commercial divers, to really have an impact on this um, species and to also get people to see lionfish as um, an environmentally friendly option, something that they can be involved in and ordering and also creating a demand for. Um, and getting people involved uh, has, been both creating this incentive and working with the commercial harvesters as well as with the public, uh, making, making them aware of lionfish as a, a safe alternative. Once the spines are removed, there's um, really nothing dangerous about the fish's meat. And it's a safe and really easy to cook with and delicious fish. And so we've really pushed that and worked with a lot of chefs around the state um, to get them to offer samples and to try lionfish and to create new recipes and dishes to get people to try that. So <clears throat> this uh, chart in the bottom really shows that the change over the last couple of years in that market in 2010 we had no uh, real commercial landings to note and then that has slowly grown over the last couple of years and really in 2017 we saw this very large um, growth in that market a little over 120,000 pounds of fish uh, removed in 2017. So and I'll, I'll talk about this with the next slide as well, but in 2018, we did see a marked decrease um, and there's uh, no real population estimate on this, um, but anecdotally, we have seen a significant decrease in the numbers of fish that are coming in in the last year. Uh, just kind of across the state, there has seemed to be a little bit less density in the lionfish populations. Um, we're really seeing a lot of that with our commercial landings as well as just recreational divers um, saying we're seeing a difference from a year ago and the sites that we were going to used to be covered and now we're seeing far fewer of those um, lionfish around which is great um, but we're thinking that this is probably uh, more than likely this is following your typical invasive species curve that there is an exponential growth um, and now we may potentially be in the plateau stage where the population may be plateauing to a slightly decreased level. So we work with the, the commercial market to develop um, this interest and we really only require a saltwater products license uh, in order to sell to wholesale dealers. And so this is a little bit more of a breakdown of that market. Um, as I mentioned before, this really is not a fish that uh, can be fished for very easily with a hook and line. 
we tend to see um, kind of a marginal amount of fish caught through traps. And uh, every once in a while, somebody will catch one by hook or by trawl, but the vast majority of landings occur through diving. Uh, and a lot of our commercial divers, this is uh, one of the species we're encouraging, and they seem to be very interested in um, growing that market, especially in off seasons uh, when there's less on other species. But you can also see that change in the number of landings in 2018 compared to 2017 there. Uh, so this is our, our big outreach event, um, Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day. So our most recent one was last month in Destin, and this is in the fourth one that we've done. Um, this is a, a state resolution event every third weekend in May every year. Uh, it's a large both outreach and in conjunction with the biggest lionfish removal tournament of the year. Uh, this previous year, they removed 19,167 lionfish, and that's including a pre-tournament as well as the actual weekend of the tournament. Um, but a really large number, it's the most that's ever come in for a single tournament event. Uh, and that's um, one of our biggest pushes to really get both our outreach messaging out there um, to launch a lot of these incentive programs for the summer and then to also showcase you know, here's a tournament with a lot of lionfish coming in to um, get the public more involved and let them see you know, what might be out of sight but is really having an impact on these ecosystems. And then some of our other programs that are really growing um, more recently as we're doing some outreach in classrooms, uh, providing the opportunity for uh, students to have death sections hands-on, as well as providing some of these um, lesson plans and materials for teachers to access uh, and build into their curriculums. <clears throat> and students will have the opportunity to uh, work with some lab partners to over the anatomy of lionfish and some of the characteristics of them that make them such a successful invader and also talk a little bit about um, their reproductive biology, how that affects the way that they have impacted the invaded range and their population structure and what effects they might have on the population of our natural ecosystems. And along with that, um, creating an opportunity online for teachers to really access and use these materials and build them into their curriculums in their own time. So this is a, <clears throat> an ongoing part of our new website, uh, building up these activity pages and lesson plans, um, videos and PowerPoint presentations that teachers can access at any time and use in their classroom uh, to help get that messaging out there, but also um, supporting a lot of our other outreach programs as well. Uh, and then finally, I'll just mention we have a number of innovative strategies. We started off with seven, uh, we're down to about five uh, that are continuing on. And these are innovative strategies to try um, different methods of um, harvesting lionfish that hopefully will reduce the amount of effort involved in going after specifically lionfish. So two of these are robotics, um, ROV units that are being developed to target lionfish. Uh, or trap items like this one in the video in the bottom right is a trap design that attracts lionfish, which hopefully will keep other species out um, and allows uh, larger numbers of people to be involved and to hopefully get lionfish from below diveable depth since recreational divers are limited to 130 feet and above. But we know that lionfish have populations much deeper than that. Uh, this picture in the top right is a ROV video from below 500 feet. And we can see that there are significant populations at that depth, um, but as of now, not a reliable way for harvesting lionfish from there. Uh, so these um, traps in particular, uh, working to get the permitting so they can test those sites in those areas and testing is ongoing this year for those designs. Um, and they're really working on um, optimizing a design that will limit the risk of bycatch and avoid any ghost fishing um, or any line entanglements. And so those are projects that hopefully in the next year we'll really get some answers from and hopefully have some successful <coughs> opportunities for harvesting and a uh, different method. And so in the future as this program is developing, growing, um, working towards finding new ways for people to be involved in removal and awareness, especially getting more people on the water, but um, also in educating the general public. 
uh, working towards some of these adaptive strategies, some new <clears throat> new ways of harvesting lionfish, uh, continuing to update any messaging based on current research, and ensuring that any regulatory barriers that may exist are um, removed in order to continue encouraging people to be involved. And recently really working with uh, other states, trying to coordinate um, efforts with other agencies and across state borders, as this is an issue that uh, affects the whole Gulf of Mexico's coastline and then all the way up the eastern seaboard as well. So there's a lot of opportunity for collaborative approaches. Um, Florida has really been a unique program for that. It's the only state that currently has a full-time program dedicated to lionfish and addressing that issue. And so there's a lot of opportunity to work with other states as well as um, we work with people who contact us to try and help start up their own programs in their own states. Uh, and as we work towards additional funding opportunities, looking for opportunities to fund those new strategies like traps and ROVs, uh, as well as any research gaps looking at population structure or changes in um, reproductive biology, anything that we don't know about lionfish that can be useful in addressing the problem uh, and continuing to really encourage and um, promote and subsidize these recreational and commercial removal efforts. <laughs> so our um, information, a lot more information is available on our FWC website. And in connection with that, we have a FWC Refrangers page linked to that that has a lot of information on our diving incentive programs, um, lists of wholesale dealers and restaurants that we know that serve lionfish around the state, as well as event calendars. Um, for a lot of these tournaments, especially in the summertime. And then I've included our contact information. Um, there are two and will be three of us working on the lionfish program here in Tallahassee, and we are connected through that lionfish at myfwc.com account, and then my specific one is below that. And we also have a, <coughs> a Facebook page where we try to keep updates on any current events or um, new updates to any of our programs. And hopefully this video works, but with that, um, I can take any questions you have. Um, this uh, video is off the coast of the Panhandle, and hopefully, if you can see it well, uh, gives you an idea for the densities that we might see in some of these sites, where it's really a wreck that should house lots of different species, but we're really just um, kind of covered up in lionfish. And you can see that divers can have a pretty significant impact even in just a short period of time. Um, lionfish don't exhibit avoidance behavior unless they've been targeted before. So a lot of lionfish don't avoid divers on their own. Uh, they don't have any natural predators in this region, and so they don't, um, they just don't exhibit that behavior. They're not afraid of anything here. Great, thank you, Mike. That was very informative. Um, I know I learned a lot as someone who's not really work on the fishery side of things very much. Um, so <clears throat> we have time to take some questions. Um, please note that you were muted when you um, joined the call. So if you do have a question, please make sure you unmute your audio. Um, I will start. I'm just curious, Mike, when you have densities like shown in this video and then another picture you showed where pretty much all you see is lionfish yeah. what are they then eating when there's like there seems to be nothing left <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> in a lot of cases it seems like they do they exhibit a lot of high site fidelity meaning that they'll really pick a spot and they'll stay there unless something forces them to move so in some cases it seems like they may move at that point at least a little bit um, to a new location, but even in these sites where it appears that there's no other species, there are still some smaller um, fishes or invertebrates around, and they do kind of find a little bit of food, but we are also starting to see cases where um, cannibalism seems to be occurring. And so in some cases, these populations where it looks like there's just line fish remaining, uh, they may start to prey on each other, <clears throat> particularly if there's a a big difference in size or age of the fish on that site. Interesting, thank you. Any other questions? And just note that your line might be muted. 
Okay, great. And I always take that as a sign that you really covered um, all the information that people were curious about. So um, as folks know, I will post this, or we will post this call on the website. And when we do, I will include below the, the link for the call itself, I'll include some of these great links that might have in this presentation. So you'll be able to click directly from the page that those calls are on. Um, so thank you again so much for that update. Seems like there's some some great progress being made and um, it's good to see all the activity going on on that issue. So um, I just have a few updates to share with folks. Um, we've got some great events coming up over um, the course of the summer and into the fall. Um, hopefully everyone has saved the date for July 17th is the 2019 Everglades Invasive Species Summit hosted by Everglades SISMA. Um, coming up in October, we have the Florida Aquatic Plant Management Society Annual Conference. And then on October 29th, the Central Florida SISMAs have joined together to host this workshop in partnership with each other. Um, so they're doing a grass and sedge identification workshop in Apopka. And the full details for these events are available on, um, on our website at the calendar. And the October 29th workshop, there will be details forthcoming. But if you visit the calendar for the Everglades Invasive Species Summit, the link to register and all the additional information is there. Um, so some great events coming up. And then just wanted to share our SISMA call for the next few months. In July, we're going to have Cody Miller of the Osceola SISMA. And she's going to share a presentation on how to grow your SISMA some hard-earned lessons learned um, from bringing the Osceola Sisma kind of up and, and getting them running. So this is the presentation if you weren't able to join at the um, FLEPSI conference. She's going to share this on one of our calls and this will give us an opportunity to just to kind of talk about um, some of the struggles that Sisma's face. And then on Wednesday, August 28th, we have some um, folks from FWC who are going to present on a conservation blueprint project and an actions tracker tool that is available um, for folks to participate in that effort. So again, um, please join us each month. Uh, the fourth month, excuse me, the fourth Wednesday of every month at 1.30. Um, past calls are available at this link that I mentioned. So visit our website and it usually takes about a week. So this call will be up um, hopefully next week, but the following week for sure. And again, I'll include some of those great links from Mike's presentation directly on the page. Um, please follow FISP on Facebook at FloridaInvasives.org. We're also on Instagram at protect underscore Florida. And um, with that, we'll wrap up today's call. Thank you everyone so much for joining us and look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a great rest of your week.